Afternoon, guys. Thank you for coming back in. It's always a bit risky when you do your presentation after a coffee break, because you're never entirely certain whether people are actually going to come back to see you or not. Um, as Alan mentioned, I did hurt my leg. The reason why I'm behind the lectern, it's not some psychological defense. It's to stop me from falling over. So let's get that away. Um, yeah, so my name is Mark Edwards. I work for an agency called Brand Genetics. We are a front-end insights and innovation agency, offices in London and, and Sao Paulo. And we work with companies like AB InBev, Unilever, Racky Benkiza, Pepsi, to help them see things that others haven't, opportunities that they haven't yet uncovered. And we're about 20 odd years old now, and we've recently gone through a bit of a, bit of a growth spurt. So it's a great place to be at the moment. All our work is built on one very simple, very profound philosophy. But I'll come to that in a second. I wanted to start um, with a few words about why in the near future our jobs won't exist. Now, that sounds awfully apocalyptic, doesn't it? Um, let, me, let me try and soften that down by telling you the reason why I say this is based on this Japanese commercial. <laughs> Now, if you're confused by that, and let's face it, you probably are, um, let me put that in context. That's an advert for Clorette's Mint Tab, and it's meant to convey the message of instant, effective, fresh breath that lasts for 10 minutes. Okay, good. The key thing is that this ad by McCann Tokyo was the first to be led by an AI creative director. In fact, what they did was they gave the same brief to an AI creative director a human creative director. Both were allowed to go and make ads. And then at the ISBA conference, they showed these ads to 200 industry professionals who said that the AI ad was the better one. In other words, the machines won. Let me put that into context. For a while, as we've heard, the world of artificial intelligence has all been the realm of science fiction. Blade Runner, Terminator, Short Circuit. But the reality is that it is today's reality. It's very much a fact of life. We've heard about Alexa and Siri. Some of us might have got into driverless cars or been diagnosed by an AI medic. It's part of our everyday vocabulary. It's the new corporate buzzword. Must do something with AI. And investment in AI has grown tenfold in the last four years. But one of the biggest challenges is that it's becoming increasingly clear that many jobs that exist today will be automated in coming years. It's predicted that AI will replace 16% of all jobs in the next decade, and millions of workers will be reporting into or supervised by robots or AI bosses. And we know that this is a particular problem for so-called lower-skilled jobs. But what about more creative jobs like insight, innovation, design? Our jobs, right? In the past, we might have considered creativity a uniquely human trait. And this is a wake-up call. We're already seeing advanced AI with machine learning enter creative industries, whether it's IBM's Watson Chef, creating amazingly innovative recipe combinations. Or maybe it's an AI composer, which can apparently write music that's more Beethoven than Beethoven. Or, depending on your generation, more Bieber than Bieber. Or back to our crazy canine friend, the AI creative director. These examples all demonstrate just how creative AI can be. 
So why not an AI innovation director? Why not an AI head of insight, head of experience? Will the audience of CX 2025 look more like this? Well, this is where the brand genetics philosophy comes into play. We profoundly believe that the future is actually human. The future of insight and innovation is human. And let me spend the rest of this presentation telling you why I think that's the case. This isn't a Luddite perspective. Uh, when we're, we are pretty much cyber optimists, we're actually working with Jonathan's company and Discover AI at the moment. But we need to recognize that there are critical human advantages that we can and should be tapping into as the, raise, as the rise of AI and machine learning continues to permeate the creative world. Because although there have been huge advances in artificial intelligence, there's been next to no advance in artificial consciousness. And core to consciousness is the ability to feel things be it joy, pain, sadness, boredom, although hopefully not in this presentation. So in a world where we increasingly leave the data to AI to do faster, better, more accurately, I want to argue that innovators and insight professionals and experienced professionals should be focusing their attention on feelings. More specifically, I want to make a case for three key contributions that feelings can make to delivering better insights? How can we identify new opportunities through what we ourselves feel? How can we create innovations that feel right for others? And how can we get others to feel the same way about these ideas as we do? It is, if you will, our manifesto for human-centered insight and innovation. Let's start with our own feelings. How can we better tap into these? How can we identify new opportunities through what we feel? I want to start with a bit of fun. You've all got sort of pen and paper in front of you. You can just grab, grab a pen and paper at the moment, everyone. And I want you to draw a picture of the person to your left. Pen and paper, draw a picture of the person to your left. You've got 20 seconds for this, guys, so I'm not expecting the Mona Lisa. Um, <laughs> Five more seconds. Don't forget the nose. You look funny without a nose. OK, good. Now, the objective here is that I gave you a quick random task, and you were able to pick up pen, paper, and you were able to get it done. Maybe some of you got it done better than others, but. <laughs> A random task, but you're all able to pick it up and you got it done. The challenge is that AI deals in data and algorithms. So whilst automated creativity can learn, it remains rule-based. It can't pick up a random task and simply run with it. AI will always be better at measuring that which already exists rather than that which could exist. But as insight and innovation and experienced professionals, we deal in a world of risk. We know that many of the things we try won't work. But whilst the computer might say no, there comes a time when we have to take a leap of faith. Otherwise, we wouldn't do anything. Think of some of the great innovations of recent time, and you'll find a story of success against adversity, despite of data. Red Bull. Red Bull came in, broke all the rules. Doesn't taste particularly great. Priced at a massive premium, but it managed to create a whole new category. Today, the brand is valued at around $9 billion. Then you've got Nespresso. Data, quant data, told Nestle again and again and again, this is a niche idea, don't do it. But Nestle persevered, and the brand is now worth roughly $5 billion worldwide. 
And since uh, we're doing a, a presentation, no conference is complete without an Apple example. Steve Jobs famously said, a lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. Well, even when he showed them the iPhone, a lot of expert naysayers said, no, no, it won't work. Most famously, of course, Steve Ballmer of Microsoft. And yet Apple defied them. And the iPhone became the creative leap that defined a decade. We find it's often the little insights rather than the big data that inspires these sorts of innovations. Insights are often sparked by individual instances. So we've set about de-averaging our research, moving away from the norms, moving away from the mass, and paying it more attention to the sparks of insights that may not be representative, but they help us see the world afresh. They ignite new thinking. These are edgy insights that excite us. Sure, they can and, you know, we should be, where possible, be backed up with data. But data without that feeling is never going to drive real innovation and change. No story of innovation starts with the line, well, I was looking at the data. It starts with an observation. I watched this woman dress her child. I watched this man cross the road. The story of the individual is more powerful than a million data points. So how can we ensure that we create innovations that feel right for others, for the target audience? Innovations that can work in the complex and dynamic contextual tapestry in which innovations must exist, survive, and thrive. To help me answer this, let me share a bit of a philosophical thought experiment. A nice bit of philosophy for a Thursday afternoon. This is um, a thought experiment called Mary the Color Scientist. And as the name suggests, Mary is a brilliant color scientist. But for the sake of this exercise, she lives in a purely black and white world. Mary specializes in the color blue. She knows, for example, just which wavelength combinations from the sky stimulate the retina and exactly what physiological impact blue produces on the body. In fact, she knows everything there is to know about the color blue from a data point of view. But my question is this. If Mary is suddenly released from her black and white world and looks up at the sky, will she learn anything? It's an open question. Some will argue yes, some will say no. But from our point of view, the answer is profoundly yes. We do learn something from experiencing it firsthand. Too often, though, I find that we spend our time a bit like Mary, locked in a black and white world, the corporate world, the world of meetings and uh, office politics, and not experiencing the context firsthand or understanding the people that we are creating for. This is why empathy, being able to feel what others feel and experiencing the world from their perspective, is so, so important. It's a key skill for harvesting insights. So what does this look like? Well, at Brand Genetics, we look to create situations in which we, our clients and consumers, can experience ideas and innovations in context. So we've run and participated in, in countless um, ethnographies around the world. We've had, um, on a project for hosiery, we've had male clients wear tights so they can understand what it's like because otherwise they've just got a story to build from. They don't have the experience. And uh, in this particular case, this is for a, this is a project looking at house parties. We, bought, we created a fake house party for the clients. And we hired actors to come in and play the archetypal party guests. The drunk, the friend who thinks his music selection is the best, the guy who turns up late because you know, his car got stolen, or whatever it is. But we brought them into the world. We got them to experience the world that their innovation has to live in. However you do it, I do suggest and advise that you go out there and try and put yourselves in the shoes of your consumer. 
As someone said earlier, I think, get out of the office. Get out there. Explore. See for yourself. Finally, we all know that innovation is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. A lot of that perspiration is spent trying to get an idea through an organization or a business that is usually geared for efficiency and repetition. So how can you create emotional impact that gets others on board with an idea and drive change? How can we get others to feel the same way as us? Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you might have noticed that when I put that chart up with the list of jobs and the threat from AI, CEO was pretty much at the bottom. In fact, I think you only had to be a dentist to be safer from the, the digital revolution. But the CEO is human too. And as Kahneman has shown, humans are not the rational beings we'd like to think we are. We post-rationalize our emotions. We understand this with consumers. We talk about system one and system two a lot, but we forget that when the same applies when trying to convince senior decision makers. Let me bring this to life with one final example, and you'll all recognize the Dove Real Beauty campaign. Nowadays, it seems like a stroke of genius, a no-brainer, right? Well, at the time, like most good ideas, it was rejected outright. Senior decision makers within Unilever felt that women might say that this is what they wanted, but when it came down to it, they would still prefer the old-fashioned idea and norms of flawless beauty. So how were they eventually convinced to try it? Vast amounts of quantitative data, A, B comparison, swipe left, swipe right. No. It was only when someone had the bright idea of showing the concept to the wives and girlfriends of the decision makers, filming their responses, and then showing the guys how positively the women in their own families felt about it, they finally woke up to the potential of the idea. We can learn from Kahneman. We must learn from Kahneman and take this lesson on board by bringing to life the human stories that help make data meaningful. We first have to capture the heart with the emotion and then capture the mind with the data. Stories on steroids. So since CEOs and senior management are likely to be human for the foreseeable future, we have to find ways to appeal to their emotion first before giving them the hard facts that help rationalize these decisions. Ultimately, it's about winning hearts and minds to get an idea through an organization. Now, as we've seen, and it's been a bit of a theme today, in the end, the future is likely to be human and artificial intelligence working hand in hand. Accelerating learning. But finding that right balance is key. We need to understand and build on what it truly means to be human and what that means for insight. The Brand Genetics Manifesto for Human-Centered Insight is as follows. Embrace individual perspectives, including your own gut feeling, to uncover new opportunities. Champion the power of empathy, the ability to feel what others feel, to create innovations that feel right in context. And finally, create stories that give data real meaning, tangible meaning, and help others feel as excited, as passionate about your insight, your idea, or your innovation as you do. If you can do this, you're not just future-proofing your insight roles, your experience roles, but also, I would argue, creating better, more successful, more human-centered business decisions. Thank you very much.